Well, a lot of you guys asked for it, so I've been working hard to deliver it. I'm of course speaking about a Core i5 version of February's 5 generations of Core i7's processors video, which took an in-depth look at gaming performance on every mainstream Core i7 processor since 2012's Sandy Bridge 2600K. For this video, I've gone one better and included every generation of Core i5 processors released to date, with the exception of the dual-core Clarkdale processors. This means 2009's Linfield Core i5-750 has been included, along with Sandy Bridge, Ivy Bridge, Haswell, Broadwell, and of course, Skylake Core i5 processors. The format for this video will be much the same as the Core i7 version. All processors have been locked at 4GHz, with any power saving or throttling features disabled. That said, I have tweaked the benchmarks ever so slightly. Some of my most beloved critics pointed out that in the previous Core i7 comparison, only GPU bound games were used for testing. Obviously that wasn't true given the inclusion of The Witcher 3, Fallout 4, Just Cause 3 and Grand Theft Auto 5. Still, of the 9 games included, 4 of them were mostly GPU bound so you might ask why include them in a CPU comparison. The reason is simple, the entire point of the comparison was to try and determine if gamers still rocking a Sandy Bridge processor really need to upgrade to Intel's latest Skylake architecture. Testing only CPU bound games doesn't really paint an accurate or complete picture, especially when the majority of PC games are very much GPU bound. Gamers addicted to Star Wars Battlefront for example will receive the same performance with either the Core i7-2600K or 6700K even when running extreme GPU setups, whilst the opposite is true in any of the CPU bound games I just mentioned. Still, in an effort to try and keep everyone happy, I have included Armour 3 this time, a ridiculously CPU bound open world military tactical shooter. Also included is Civilization Beyond Earth and Ashes of the Singularity, which was tested both in the DirectX 11 and DirectX 12 modes. There's a heap of data in this video, so for those that want to quickly check out all the graphs, it might be best to check the link in the description to the text-based version at our website. I'm starting with Star Wars Battlefront, a game which we already know isn't very CPU demanding, at least in the single player tutorial mode where I have to test for accurate results. This is a great indicator of typical gameplay where the GPU is the limiting factor. Here we see that even the lowly old 760 is able to deliver strong performance with the GTX 980 Ti. As expected, the GTX 970 results are much the same. Only the 760 falls behind the pack, though not by a significant margin. Battlefront was also tested using a pair of Radeon R9-390X graphics cards in Crossfire, and here we see that while the all-important minimum frame rates are surprisingly close, the more recently released Core i5 models delivered better top-end performance. Like Battlefront, Battlefield 4 is another popular title that at least when playing the single player mode isn't very CPU demanding. Here all 6 processors including the 760 provided competitive results with the GTX 980 Ti. Similar performance trends were seen when downgrading the GPU to the GTX 970 and it's only the 760 that falls a few frames behind the newer Core i5 models. Now with a pair of 390X graphics cards we see that there's a slight difference in performance between most of the Core i5 processors. Still, it's important to note that even the 760 was able to push past the 120fps barrier without dipping below 100fps at any time, which is very surprising, at least to me. Here we have yet another mostly CPU bound first person shooter that even the old Core i5-760 still plays well with, and all these results with the GTX 980 Ti are both impressive and surprising. As you'd expect, downgrading the GPU to the GTX 970 only reduced the performance margins, and here we see the Skylake 6600K beating the old 760 by just 5 FPS, which equates to a mere 7% performance margin. Increasing the rendering firepower with two 390X graphics cards only saw 4 FPS separate the minimum frame rate of the 760 and the 6600K. Civilization Beyond Earth places a fair load on the CPU, though the results we see when testing with the GTX 980 Ti at just 1080p aren't extreme. The 6600K is just 10% faster than the Sandy Bridge based 2500K. That said, the Broadwell 5675C provided the best result with a minimum of 84fps and a 158fps average. Moving to the GTX 970 reduced the margin between the Haswell, Broadwell and Skylake processors and they can all be seen dipping to just 80fps with a similar average result. The Linfield 760 really bombed out in this test, dropping to just 55fps, making it 31% slower than the Haswell part and 25% slower than the 2500K that came after it. I should point out that there was no 390X Crossfire testing for this title since Crossfire wasn't working and this was the case for quite a few of the games we tested with unfortunately. Things get crazy in our Fallout 4 Boston City test and here games require some serious CPU firepower. 
The 5675C comes out ahead here as I suspect it's able to put that massive L4 cage to good use. We see a nice progression in performance from Sandy Bridge to Ivy Bridge and then to Haswell which is nice. The Core i5-760 really struggled in this title with frame dips as low as 33 FPS. Because the section of Fallout 4 that we benchmark is so extremely CPU bound, downgrading to the GTX 970 has a very limited impact on performance. Grand Theft Auto 5 is one of the best examples we have of a well balanced game and it does a good job of taking advantage of the latest hardware. That said, with the GTX 980 Ti handling the rendering, the 4690K, 5675C and 6600K were virtually indistinguishable. The performance did start to drop off with the 3570K and was reduced further by the 2500K. Although the frame rates were still very high, the 760 was good but slower than the more modern Core i5 processors. Interestingly, the Core i5-760 recovered somewhat with the GTX 970 and was able to match the 2500K. Still, the 3570K was a decent step up from the 2500K and the 4690K provided yet another step forward before we hit a brick wall with the newer Broadwell and Skylake processors. Just Cause 3 is a super fun and very CPU intensive game. That said, even with the GTX 980 Ti gaming at just 1080p, the Sandy Bridge 2500K does very well. The same unfortunately can't be said for the 760 which dropped almost 30% lower than the 2500K at 48fps. Even with the slower GTX 970 handling the rendering, the 760 still looks pretty slow as it allowed the frame rate to hit 47fps at times, though admittedly the average frame rate isn't that bad. Just Cause 3 is another title that doesn't support Crossfire, so we skipped testing the 390X graphics cards here as well. Rainbow Six Siege isn't very CPU intensive at all, and as a result the Core i5-760 is able to hang in there with the much newer Core i5 processors. The 760 kept the minimum frame rate above 120 FPS, so obviously the game is very playable on this processor. The GTX 970 provided similar performance margins, and although the 760 was the only CPU to dip below 100 FPS, at 92 FPS the game was still very playable. Rise of the Tomb Raider was a game that I initially thought was quite CPU intensive when first played, as it does make quite good use of at least 4 threads. However, as you can see, even the 760 is able to hang with the much newer i5 processors such as the 6600K for example. The GTX 970 saw the 760, 2500K and 3570K all deliver the exact same performance while the newer Core i5 processors were just a frame or two faster. Testing for The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt took place at the town of Novigrad, and here the game is quite CPU demanding. Despite that, the performance margin between the 2500K and 6600K was almost non-existent. It was only the 760 that dropped off in performance, albeit by just 5fps when comparing the minimum frame rates. The GTX 970 provided some interesting results, and the 760 was able to match the 2500K here, which meant essentially it wasn't really any slower than the newer Core i5 processors, which is another really big surprise. When we move to the 390X Crossfire configuration, the 760 does start to look dated, and although the minimum frame rate here isn't that poor, the average frame rate would suggest the 760 spent quite a bit of time rendering less than 60 FPS. Now for the game many of you have no doubt been waiting for, Armor 3. This game puts a serious stranglehold on the CPU, and this can be seen when testing the GTX 980 Ti. Although the 6600K, 5675C and 4690K all provided similar performance, there was a huge drop in frame rate when moving to the 3570K. From the 4690K to the 3570K, the minimum frame rate dropped by 15% and we saw a further 8% drop when going from the 3570K to the 2500K. Finally, we bottomed out at 59 FPS with the 760 making it 30% slower than the Skylake and Haswell processors. Now with the GTX 970, we fall just short of 80 FPS with the higher end Core i5 processors and while they saw a significant reduction in performance when moving from the GTX 980 Ti to the 970, the same wasn't true for the older 2500K and 760. In fact, those processors dropped just 1 to 2 frames, which meant the 760 was just 17% slower than the Haswell, Broadwell and Skylake processors. The best example we currently have of DirectX 12 performance is Ashes of the Singularity in my opinion, so I've added some DirectX 11 and DirectX 12 comparison testing with all 6 Core i5 processors using the GTX 980 Ti, GTX 970 and Fury X. Using the GTX 980 Ti, we find some interesting results. The more modern, more powerful Core i5 processors were actually faster when using DirectX 11, as Nvidia's GTX 980 Ti is still more efficient here due to its hardware design and more efficient drivers. 
As the CPU performance is reduced, we see that the 3570K provides the same performance in DirectX 11 and DirectX 12. By the time we hit the Sandy Bridge 2500K, the processor efficiency has dropped to a level where the lower CPU overhead of the DirectX 12 API overcomes any shortcomings of the GTX 980 Ti's DirectX 12 performance in this title. The 760 amplifies this further as now the gameplay is significantly better in DirectX 12 mode due to the fact that the CPU isn't holding the GPU up as much. As we've found more often than not, the slower GTX 970 evens up the playing field, though again the 760 is faster when running in DirectX 12. Looking at the DirectX 12 results, the Fury X performs exceptionally well, and the 2500K through to the 6600K are able to get the absolute maximum performance from this high-end graphics card. DirectX 12 also helps out the Core i5-760 significantly, and although it's still much slower than even the 2500K, it does provide very playable 50fps. First up, we have the power consumption results from Tomb Raider using the GTX 970. And as you can see, there have been improvements along the way with the exception of Broadwell and its power-hungry L4 cache. The Skylake system consumed 8% less power than the Haswell system and 19% less than the Sandy Bridge system. These are noteworthy improvements, though they'll probably fail to blow the socks off the average gamer. The CPU bound just cause saw a similar 20% reduction in power usage when going from the 2500K to the 6600K. Interestingly, the heavily overclocked Linfield 760 at 4GHz only consumed an extra watt when compared to the 2500K. Finally, before wrapping things up, I've provided some memory and cache performance for those interested. Sandy Bridge was tested with DDR3 2133 memory as this was the highest frequency we could maintain 100% stability with, and the 760 was limited to 1833 MHz. Well, if you've made it this far, congratulations, and if you just hit conclusion in the video index, then shame on you. Before I break down the results, let me just say that this video isn't meant to disappoint or upset those who have invested in one of Intel's latest Skylake processors. Hell, I've knowingly purchased a few of them myself. After all, if I were building a new computer today, at the top of my wish list would be a Skylake Core i5 or i7 processor. Instead, the point of this video was to provide those that are still rocky and older generation processor a clear indication of the kind of performance they stand to gain by upgrading. Going all the way back to the first Core i5 processors based on the Linfield architecture, we see that Skylake offers a very real performance improvement and even Sandy Bridge was a decent step forward. That said, for the most part, when paired with a relatively high-end GPU such as the GTX 970, the Core i5-760 was able to deliver very playable performance in most of the games tested. It's really only the extreme titles such as Fallout 4, Just Cause 3 and Armor 3 where those extra frames do make a noticeable difference. Of course, out of the box, the Core i5-760 is going to be significantly slower than what was seen here as it operates at just 2.8GHz, so be sure to keep that in mind. The same can be said for the 3.3GHz 2500K, though the fully unlocked clock multiplier makes that a dead easy CPU to overclock. Performance wise, the margins are very similar to those found when testing the Core i7 processors. If we look at the CPU intensive titles only, here's what we find. Using the GTX 970, the Skylake and Broadwell processors are 14% faster than the Sandy Bridge 2500K and 8% faster than the 3570K. They were, however, 25% faster than the 760, though that isn't a huge gain given the 7 year age gap. With the faster 980Ti handling the rendering, the Skylake and Haswell processors were again just 14% faster than the Sandy Bridge 2500K. That said, they were now 35% faster than the 760. Naturally, the margins will grow when using more powerful GPU configurations, particularly if SLI or Crossfire is employed, for example. Now, if we look at the non-CPU intensive titles, we find very different results. Using either the GTX 980 Ti or GTX 970, the top tied CPUs such as the 6600K, 5675C and 4690K were all well under 10% faster than the 760, while they provided virtually the same performance as the 2500K. So depending on what games you play, it is possible to make do with a very old Core i5 processor in today's games running a respectable GPU. That said, when the CPU is called to action at times, the 760 looked a little slow, though admittedly that didn't happen often. Still, I could easily justify the upgrade to Haswell, Broadwell or Skylake from Linfield. I probably couldn't say the same for Sandy Bridge and certainly not for Ivy Bridge. DirectX 12 isn't going to bury these older generation processors either, and that was something a few viewers were arguing in the Core i7 video. Ashes of the Singularity, which is a very well put together title and is extremely CPU intensive, shows how DirectX 12 doesn't hurt slower 
processors, but rather lends them a helping hand. The GTX 980 Ti and Fury X results are a perfect example of this. Looking at the Fury X results, which are the most extreme, we see that although Sandy Bridge falls away slightly under DirectX 11, that isn't the case when using DirectX 12. Here it's able to match the performance of the Haswell and Skylake chips. Although DirectX 12 helped the much older Core i5-760, it wasn't able to completely make up the performance deficit. There are obviously still some limitations here that can't be overcome by the low level API, but that's hardly surprising. So for now, it appears as though DirectX 12 is only going to prolong the life of processors such as the 2500K rather than end it. Virtual reality is another hot topic and I was told a few times in regards to the Core i7 video that the 2600K would struggle with VR as a minimum of 90 FPS is desired. I don't know about you, but a mere 12% drop in performance from the 6600K to the 2500K when looking solely at CPU intensive games, tell me the 2500K should be VR ready. So for now, the gaming future looks bright for anyone rocking a Sandy Bridge Core i5 or newer, and I suspect that's a good many of you. Thanks for joining me again for another episode of Hardware Unboxed. I'm your host Matt as always, and I look forward to seeing you guys next time.